welcome to this week's edition of Freedom Quest. I'm your host, Jay Wyatt Mondesai, our president of the Philadelphia NAACP and publisher of the Philadelphia Sunday Sun, Johnny Cochran. The name is almost synonymous with what the public likes and hates about the legal profession. His firm to date has won over $1 billion in verdicts. Few other lawyers can claim to have put their stamp on the legal profession with the same level of indelibility. Mr. Cochran has been a lawyer for nearly 40 years, and in that time, he has taken on dozens of groundbreaking cases and emerged as a pivotal figure in race relations and in criminal litigation. Mr. Cochran, of course, gained international recognition as one of America's best and most controversial lawyers for leading the dream team defense of accused killer O.J. Simpson in what tabloids and television have dubbed the trial of the century. Many people formed their perception of Mr. Cochran based on his work in that trial, but long before the Simpson trial and since, Johnny Cochran has been a leader in the fight for justice for all Americans, and he has now written a new book, A Lawyer's Life. It is his story as a member of the bar. Johnny Cochran, welcome to Freedom Quest. Jay, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Lawyer's Life. Now, you wrote Journey to Justice, which was your autobiography. Yes. What did you leave out? Well, you know, Journey to Justice was basically, you know, where I came from, mm -hmm. about my faith, my parents, my sisters, the, the, the strong family background. This book is more case-related. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's my 40 years in court and my representation of clients, the, the, the OJs and the NoJs, those you know about, those you never heard about. And what we were trying to do in all of these kinds of cases and how we tried to change uh, someone at the face of justice. The dedication to the book is a number of people like Thurgood Marshall, Damon Keith, a Leon Higginbottom, who of course hails from here in Philadelphia. But then there is another name that I didn't recognize. So I'm just happy to ask you, who is Revis Ortique? Or did I say his name you incorrectly? Said, you said it just correctly. Actually, I'm going to see him this, this uh, Friday. Revis Ortique was the first African-American justice on the Louisiana uh, Supreme, State Supreme Court. Which is your he, home state. Yeah, so my, it's my home state. He's like my personal hero. He fought all those years. He's a great civil rights lawyer. And he was about 68 when he went on the bench. So he'd only stayed until two years because, you know, he was, um, because of age, he had to leave at 70. But a marvelous career. And in those two years, he, he made up for all the time he hadn't been there. He, he's just a marvelous judge. And, and this book, as you said, is dedicated to all those lawyers and judges who who spent their lives trying to change society for the better. And he certainly fit that, that, uh, that category. You mentioned Thurgood Marshall several times. You mentioned, of course, his pivotal victory in Brown versus Topeka Board of Education. Why was that such a pivotal case in your mind and for the country, but also for Johnny Cochran? What, what happened in that case that, that changed the way you started to look at the law? Well, Jerry, you know, before that, I'd wanted to be a lawyer since I was 11 years of age. But, you know, at that time, we didn't know many black lawyers. I couldn't go in my neighborhood and say, hey, tell me what you do. I didn't know any white lawyers for that matter, any lawyers. The only lawyers we saw were the bumbling Algonquin J. Calhoun on television. The the old famous and Amos Amos and that's the only person I ever saw. And I knew that's not the kind of lawyer that I wanted to be or any of the rest of us are. And so uh, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer, but I didn't know exactly how I could change the paradigm that existed in my practice. And then along came, I was in high school, and Brown versus the Board of Education came along. And when I saw how Thurgood Marshall and his mentor, Charles Hamilton Houston, used and strategized to change the nine elderly Supreme Court justices and, and, and have them come out and say that separate but equal was inherently unequal, and, and it changed how we came together in this country as blacks and whites and others. And I knew then that's what I really wanted to do. So from that point on, Thurgood Marshall was my legal hero because they used the law to change society for the better, and that's what I wanted to do. The New York Times a few weeks ago called a lawyer's life and described you as the world's most famous lawyer and also the most polarizing. Is that a fair characterization? Oh, I don't know. I'm not the most polarizing, and uh, you know, I don't know I'm the most famous. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well known, I suppose. <laughs> but with regard to polarization, I think that what happens is that people—it's you know—and and, and it's all in the people's perception. I think that I am not afraid to talk about issues of race. Uh, we live in a society now where people, people, especially in the majority community, if they don't want to discuss issues of race, they'll, they'll, they'll create terms like race card, which is a ridiculous term. You can't marginalize issues of race. You can't trivialize issues of race. They're very important. People don't want to discuss race because they have a lot of guilt, and they want to pretend like there are no racial issues and no racial divisions. So they'll, they'll say, oh, you're raising race. Well, you know, you shouldn't raise race when it's not relevant. But sometimes in this country, race is more than a pink elephant in the middle of the room that everybody tiptoes around. If I see it in the workplace, if I see it in the police department, if I see it any place, 
I'm going to say what I think it is. So it doesn't matter whether somebody else doesn't like it because, you know, change comes about by virtue of people having the courage to stand up and say, hey, this is wrong. That's what Thurgood did. And so uh, Brown vs. Board of Education was all about race, wasn't it? And so, you know, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. I mean, I think that I think people should, should see for what you are and what you try to do. And if an honest attempt to make society what it ought to be, I, I would hope that wouldn't be polarizing. You begin a lawyer's life with a very carefully construction, a careful construction, reconstruction, really, of a typical day in a California highway patrolman. And it goes on for a few pages, and at the very bottom, you tell us, it's your son. Your son is a cop. He was a cop, and, and I'm very, very proud of him, Jerry. You know, I was surprised, you know, uh, when he told me he was a microbiology student at UCLA. And I expected he was going to be going to medicine. And he decided he wanted to go into uh, police work. And it's an honorable profession. And I, I start that off because I think this book is about all those people who have misperceptions about who I am. That's what I was going to ask. You, you, you chose that beginning on purpose to, to flesh out the real Johnny Cox. Oh, sure. I mean, I think that I, I was the assistant district attorney for Los Angeles County. I've been a prosecutor's place in my career. My son's a police officer. Uh, I am pro-law enforcement. But I'm also anti-bad law practices, law enforcement practices. So, again, that's not, there are no sacred cows. These people who want to take me an ideologue and say, well, I'm all for this. So, if I'm conservative, I can in no way ever endorse, <laughs> say, the, the, the Fourth Amendment and rights against legal searches and seizures. No, I'm not. I, I, I'm an issue-by-issue issue person. So, you know, I could be a liberal. But at the same token, if I thought something was going to be uh, not appropriate, I, I could speak out against that. And that's what I, that's how I really see it. And I don't think you bring about change, makes it sound where it ought to be, unless you have the courage to stand up. You know why, Jerry? Because this is not some dress rehearsal. This is the real thing. And those of us who've been blessed to get an education, get these positions, have an obligation to try to make things better than we found them. When you hear the name Johnny Cox, O.J. Simpson comes to mind, Michael Jackson, Sean Puffy Combs, a lot of celebrity defendants that you have represented. But in this book, you talk about men like Geronimo Pratt and, this, and the no James is a term that you create. Why, and why take on so many of these other kinds of cases at the same time that your plate must be just bursting full with the so-called big, big name defense? Because those are the clients that are important to me. Long before OJ or, or Tupac Shakur or Snoop Doggy Dog or any of those people, it was the no Jays who were at my door who I was representing, where we were trying to make changes. If I wanted to eliminate the, the deaths that were occurring in Los Angeles from the chokehold, I had a client named James Thomas Mincy. We got a moratorium on the chokehold in Los Angeles in 1982. And I can tell you right here tonight, there have been no more deaths in 20 years. Before that, only black and brown youths were, were being killed. So nobody knows about Mincy, but it changed things. I can represent Tupac Shakur, or I can represent Snoop, uh, and that would be, you know, nice for that moment. But, but I wanted to have cases that had a lasting impression so there would not be any more deaths because of certain things. And we changed the police culture. If I, I wanted to talk and, and deal with racial profiling on the East Coast, in New Jersey, I have four boys. If I told you their names, Keyshawn Moore, Rayshon Brown, um, Jermaine Grant, and Danny Reyes, you wouldn't know who those boys are. They're, they're called the New Jersey Four. Well, that, that is the case we use, Shep, Newfell, and I, to attack racial profiling in the United States. And we got the state of New Jersey to admit they've been engaging in racial profiling. Now, it changed the law. It changed the paradigm somewhat. So that, to me, has a great effect. Nobody knew about that no women until we, you know, got involved. And now the New York City Police Department and how they deal with this case has changed markedly. Those are the cases that, that, that mean the most to me. You, you go back in California and you talk about a young girl named Patty Diaz who had been sexually assaulted by a police officer. Nobody wanted to believe that. They wanted to believe this little girl had been sexually assaulted. And, and she looked great, uh, except for a couple of things. The cuts on her wrist where she tried to kill herself. In fact, every time she read a book, she said, this police officer's face would appear on the book. And they said, we'll only pay you $150,000. I said, okay, let's go to trial. And then when the jury gave us $10 million, we changed the paradigm in Los Angeles, the largest verdict ever, that you could, you could do this, you could, you, could, you could show that the police officer had, had, had violated a, a young lady and that it, it, was, it was compensable, and a jury of her peers would rule that. And it changed how we did business. And so, you know, I mean, those are the things that are most important to me. Leonard Deadwilder, you spent a lot of time in a lawyer's life talking about this case. And in fact, you say it's even more important in your career than the OJ case. Who was Leonard Deadwilder? Why was the case so important? Well, it was important because I was a young lawyer. I was about 27 or 28 years of age. You had just started yeah. practicing after you left the DA's office. Right, I left the city attorney's office and went out there. And it, was, it, was, it occurred about seven or eight months after 
the What's Rats were created. Yeah, from yeah, 65, yeah. 65. Yeah. A lot of our audience doesn't remember those. Yeah, so they probably, they're, they're just kids out there. But <laughs> the, the What's Rats it occurred in August of 1965. And Mr. Deadwiler was a gentleman who had just recently come to California from, from um, Georgia. And his wife was eight and a half months pregnant, and he thought she was about to deliver. And at that time, he was racing down the street in Los Angeles uh, with a white rag or handkerchief tied to his aerial in, in the south where he came from in Georgia. He thought that was a distress. And he thought as the police were running after, chasing after him, he thought they were trying to help him. As they finally pulled him over, the officer gets out of the car, takes his gun out, an LAPD officer, sticks the gun in the car, which violated all of his training, and then claims the gun lurched, the car lurched forward, and he made an instinctive grabbing motion, and having the gun in the car, pull the trigger, shoot him into dead water, who falls over on his wife, and last words were, she's having, an, she's having a baby officer. He dies. Now, this is seven, eight months after that, so they're worried to death. So they put this, they have something, an antiquated procedure called the coroner's inquest. They put this on television every day for eight days, which was unusual. Oh, it's very unusual because they don't have another right. And I am the lawyer for the family. And so it's an amazing thing because the lawyer for the family doesn't really have a standing. It's, it's so you ask questions office. when you're in the no, you, you can't ask questions. I have to ask questions through him. So the most famous thing becomes Mr. Cochran wants to know. The DA, because the DA would just ask these superficial questions, I thought. And I said, look, now you got to ask this. And so he was always in his ear. ear. And he would say, Mr. Cochran wants to know. He became very well known. And that was the first case. They kind of put me on the net. And I was, I was television for eight days at the time. Now, they, the jury ruled, uh, the coroner's jury ruled this was a justified shooting. This case was tried four or five years later by my partner, and it was lost. Because at that time, nobody had won any cases against the city of Los Angeles for police abuse. We had a lot of work left to do. But it was, it was where we started. Because I'd been in the city prosecutor's office, and I knew how things went. I knew uh, how the police operated. I knew their ability to testify. And I knew the minds and attitudes of the jurors that we had to change over period of time. You lost a Deadwiler case. Do you still stay in touch with Mrs. Deadwiler? I still do. The young baby she was carrying is now a minister. Yes, I stay in touch with L.A. In L.A. I'm from Pomona, in the, in the uh, eastern part of L.A. County. I absolutely do make, stay in touch with her. I love her to this day, you know. I wish we could have done more for her. But she did a lot because by her standing up, it opened the doors. It, it set, the, set the city on a track where later on when the Deadwiler and similar type cases happened, people understood that we were right. That this this was wrong. It shouldn't have. This was negligence. I mean, police officer puts a gun inside of a car, shoots a man under these circumstances. He's not fit no crime. He's, he's totally unarmed. Today, that case would be worth millions. We'll be right back to talk with a man who wins millions for his clients. Johnny Cochran will be right back at Free Inquest.